Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jen, and uh, thanks also for um, for inviting me along. Um, I'm really grateful for, for the opportunity to come and speak to you all about my what I've been up to in the last few years. Um, my my name's Helen, um, and I work for AOC Archaeology Group as a project officer in the Postex department, where my my role involves working with finds, uh, writing reports and publications. Um, but before I took up this role, I carried out doctoral work on Iron Age decorative practices, and I still keep up this research work whenever I can in all my, my spare time. <laughs> um, and, and that is what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I'm, I'm going to come straight out with it and tell you all that um, I have been working on a book which will very soon be out. Um, and I think that's that's why Jen invited me along because she thought I'd like the, the opportunity to, to tell you about it. And she was absolutely right. Um, uh, so during this talk, I'm going to take you through some of the themes of the book and give you an idea of what it's about. Hopefully this will make some of you want to read it. Um, there is a 25% pre-publication discount currently available, um, and I will give you some details about that later on. Um, the book is based on my 2017 PhD thesis, which I carried out at the Uni of Southampton and the British Museum as the holder of a collaborative doctoral award. It focuses on decorative practices in Iron Age Britain, but its, its roots really lie within um, interests in the broader study of the idea of art in prehistory. Um, as my, my supervisor, Andy Jones, has written, Art is a slippery and changeable category. Um, it's difficult to define in any cultural context. In modern Western society, the word art can relate to the making and consumption of visual or in haptic media, for example. Um, the, the designation of value to artworks by the art world uh, or the skillful practice of a technique, just to name some examples. The materials from prehistoric Europe traditionally discussed as art range from um, lifelike renderings of animals seen in Upper Paleolithic cave art, um, like you can see in the image here, to um, geometric patterns impressed onto late Neolithic and early Bronze Age beakers, and stylized anthropomorphic images found on late Neolithic statue menhirs, for example. By designating these objects and images as art, archaeologists acknowledge um, that their village um, their visual effects held uh, meaning or power within the communities that made and consumed them. But what were they actually for? And what did art do in a world without writing? These are the kinds of questions that the book discusses, and it presents um, and assesses a new approach to a particular assemblage of decorated objects. Studies of decorative practices in, in Europe during the Iron Age have traditionally been focused on early Celtic art. This is um, a historic and problematically named assemblage of varied objects um, that stretch geographically from um, Ireland in the west right across to the Black Sea in the east during the latter part of the first millennium BC. Um, the category of objects is hugely diverse and it has very fuzzy edges, but it can generally be defined as being made from copper alloy or gold um, and being decorated with a distinctive style of decoration known as Le Ten style, although sometimes just one of these criteria applies. Le Ten style, um, as you can see from the picture, uh, pictures here, um, features distinctive um, swirling curvilinear designs, deliberate asymmetry and um, ambiguous anthropomorphic and zoomorphic imagery. So I'm interested in these decorated objects but I'm also um, equally interested um, in other decorated Iron Age objects um, made from other materials, things like um, pots, combs, chalk objects, um, the rare wooden objects we find as well. This slide um, includes some recent finds, um, the anthropomorphic comb that you can see on the left, that was um, uh, excavated by Wessex Archaeology and Andrew Fitzpatrick has recently written about this. And the black clock bowl, um, the wooden object over on the right, um, from Dumfries and Galloway, that was recently re uh, recovered and analysed by some of my colleagues at AOC. These are both really um, exception, exceptional and special objects. 
Interestingly though, um, although some non-metal objects are skillfully decorated um, using swirly Laten designs, they historically haven't been categorised as art like their metal counterparts have. Now this probably seems really unfair to us. Um, I think it's, it's now widely acknowledged in archaeology that material value and also material categories themselves are culturally specific, not universal, and that we therefore can't project our own ideas about material value onto the past. We might see the dichotomy I'm describing as the case of archaeologists, um, whether consciously or, sub or subconsciously, um, designating the, the valuable um, metal objects as art, whilst the less, less shiny things are not art. Um, but by looking into the history of the study of um, decorated Iron Age objects, um, I think I've, I've found that there's a little bit more to it than just that. Um, I'm going to spend a few quick minutes um, just going into a bit of detail um, about the traditional dichotomy between Iron Age art and not art, um, and how we can start deconstructing these two categories. So, um, this talk is not going to be about the history of Celtic art, although it is very interesting, um, and there are lots of good places to read about it if you're interested. Um, my book includes a chapter on it, but um, I really recommend reading um, Julia Farley and Fraser Hunter's edited um, catalogue of the Celts exhibition at the BM and NMS, um, the work of John Collis and the work of Michael Morse, um, just to name some examples. Whilst I'm not giving a full history, it's important to note a few things about the way that the study of this body of material developed, particularly when we're thinking about interrogating that category. Celtic art emerged gradually as a category during the mid to late 19th century. Um, at this point in time, the word Celts was used in a variety of ways within different disciplines to refer to different things. Even within archaeology, Celtic was used um, with differing specificity to refer to different periods um, and objects for some time. Um, I, again, I, I don't have time to go into debates over the Celts in this talk, um, but the authors I've just mentioned have all done a lot of work over disentangling these debates, so I, I refer you to them for now. Um, the first mention of a Celtic art style is um, attributed to, um, to Owen Jones, who included a chapter on Celtic ornament in his design source book, um, The Grammar of Ornament, which um, you can see a page from that on the right of the screen. Um, the pages there were written by John Obadiah Westwood, um, and they cover um, early Christian art. Um, Westwood, um, he, he did not consider this style to have early origins, so he saw this as sort of a, an early early medieval phenomenon. Augustus Wollaston Franks, who was a keeper at the British Museum, then also designated a group of objects as Celtic um, as part of some work he did on the posthumous publication of John Kemble's um, Jorge Ferrales, I'm probably saying that wrong, sorry everyone, um, <laughs> a book uh, which is also entitled All Studies in the Archaeology of the Northern Nations. Um, so the, the objects that Franks looked at were swords, shields and horse gear. They'd been found in lakes and rivers during dredging um, and in terrestrial hordes during construction projects and agriculture. So providing them with dates and broader context was really difficult. But Franks established that these were pre-Roman objects dating to the Iron Age. Upon the excavation of Hallstatt in Austria during the 1840s um, and of Laten in Switzerland in 1857, Connections were then made um, between the swirly art styles on Frank's Celtic art objects and the material from the Ten. And as more and more finds were made um, across Europe, this category continued to sort of grow in size um, and diversity and to be used in larger and larger scale archaeological schemes, um, most of which have now been um, largely abandoned in, in favour of more bottom up approaches to Iron Age society and material culture. So the, the point I'm wanting to make here really is that Celtic art is a historic category um, that grew up in quite an ad hoc manner. And as, as Gosden and Hill have written, it's very much um, an archeological category made by archeologists. Um, and as they've also uh, said, it's, it's really neither Celtic nor is it art. 
From the 1890s onwards, um, field archaeology focused increasingly on settlement sites, um, adding a nice bit of texture and context to the assemblage of Iron Age metalwork that was being uh, that was being recovered from hordes and rivers. Um, among the famous Iron Age settlement sites excavated during this this sort of period of time was Glastonbury Lake Village, um, excavated by Arthur Bullies and Harold St. George Grey between 1892 and 1907. I'm going to use some specific aspects of the way that the finds from Glastonbury have been treated archaeologically um, to delve a bit further into the arts and crafts dichotomy I just as described earlier. The unique uh, and well-preserved wetland site at Glastonbury revealed buildings um, and a huge number of well-preserved artefacts of many different materials, many of them decorated. The rich material culture of the site was viewed as evidence that it was inhabited by a civilised people and it presented um, sort of a new vision of Iron Age domestic life. Um, this could be seen in articles um, such as one published uh, in December of 1911 in the Illustrated London News. Um, this, this was written by uh, Arthur Bullard himself and it was entitled Not the Road Daub Savage of the Old History Books, The Civilised Ancient Britain. So you can really see what he was getting at that title. Um, the accompanying reconstructions by the newspaper's resident artist um, Amadou Forestier um, have become some of the most, fam most famous and most reproduced um, archaeological reconstructions. Of prehistoric Britain. The artic um, you can see, yes, um, the background picture here is, is one of his um, really gorgeous um, paintings, um, which is yeah w one of my very favourite um, images of, of the Iron or what we think the Iron Age might have been like. Um, the article and images were produced with the express aim of challenging outdated impressions of Iron Age savages using the rich evidence of everyday activities and skilled craft found at Glastonbury. Emphasis was placed upon the artistic skills of Glastonbury's Iron Age inhabitants, and this was used to support the argument that they were sophisticated and civilised. So um, for Bullard, um, artistic skill was a marker of civilised people. Glastonbury Lake Village lends its name to a particular style of decorated pottery, Glastonbury ware. This pottery is found um, in abundance at um, Glastonbury and its nearby uh, wetland site, Mia. Um, and it's also been found at sites across other parts of um, southwestern England. One of the defining characteristics of Glastonbury ware is that it was often decorated with um, inscribed curvilinear Latin style patterns, sometimes using very similar motifs to the metalwork um, labelled early Celtic art constructed using those same curvilinear lines and, and shapes. However, um, its treatment by archaeologists has been quite telling, revealing biases relating to the value ascribed to particular materials and crafts. Although the presence of Latin style decoration on Glastonbury ware has been widely recognised by archaeologists since the early 20th century, and although the decorated objects of the site were presented as evidence for civilised people with um, real artistic talents. Um, it didn't lead to the incorporation of these ceramics into the category of early Celtic art, despite the fact that, um, you know, this Latin style decoration is usually a defining characteristic of, of this art style. Um, the quote here on the page from, from Grimes exemplifies um, a sort of hierarchy within which different materials and associated crafts were perhaps seen to exist, with potters um, commonly seen as borrowing their designs for metalwork. Interestingly, um, I've examined the reasons why um, um, I've, I've noted that the hierarchy became more pronounced during the early mid 20th century, um, and I don't have time to talk about it now, but maybe I'll come back to it later on. Um, I think this is partly about um, archaeological perceptions of material value in the Iron Age. But I think it's also about more fundamental ideas about the structuring of craft within society. If you Google something like, um, I don't know, Iron Age society hierarchy, you will find lots of diagrams that depict a triangle shaped societal structure with a single ruler at the top and then different social strata under that that increase with size. So you'll have the warrior nobility and um, religious practitioners, for example, quite near the top. 
and then peasants at the bottom. Um, it's quite kind of based on a feudal system, I think. Um, and this is the dominant model of Iron Age social structure for much of the 20th century. There are lots of similar versions of the same diagram, and I did deliberate putting an image um, of one on the slide, but I decided not to because they are all um, pretty problematic, and I didn't want to introduce one without having time to properly kind of critique it. Uh, the places of craftspeople within this type of model, however, um, are relevant to us here because they reflect wider thought about how craft was organised. Professional metal workers were seen as occupying a space quite close to the top of the hierarchical pyramid, supplying the warrior elite with objects of Celtic art, whilst craft people making other kinds of objects were seen as operating on a much lower level, making things in the home environment on more of an ad hoc basis. So you can see um, in the language used to refer to um, non-metal decorated objects, things like peasant art and home crafts, you can see that reflected here. So we can see that during the 20th century, the split between Iron Age art and not art was complex and derived not only from the projection of value onto certain kinds of object, but also from the way this manifested in broader models of Iron Age society. Archaeologists have, have generally moved on from the idea of a one-size-fits-all pyramid-shaped hierarchy as a way of describing Iron Age society. Um, it's been acknowledged that there are um, a whole variety of, of shapes that communities might have resumed. Work on material culture has uh, also provided for starting points um, for ways of rethinking how Iron Age craft and value worked. New materialist archaeologists have um, included new interests in materials and in things. Work on materiality, for example, uh, Chantal Conella's work on um, the archaeology of materials has led to the acknowledgement that material categories and values are culturally specific. Recent interests in cross-craft uh, interaction in prehistory provide a new lens to look at the relationships between different craftspeople and the sharing of ideas and knowledge. And Celtic art as a category of objects has also seen its own rethinking and deconstruction from loads of different angles. Um, Jellian perspectives on decoration have drawn um, on anthropology to look at what this art can do, what its effects can be. Um, and importantly, Jodie Joy has argued that all Iron Age decoration across all materials is important and that we should be asking why decorate of all objects, not just metalwork. So um, these kind of recent advances um, demonstrate ways in which the categories of art and craft are kind of being gradually deconstructed. But this book was born out of the idea that although archaeologists acknowledge the fact that Celtic art is an artificial archaeological category, we have tended to continue, uh, continue sticking within it when studying Iron Age decoration. So, for example, the, the technologies of Enchantment Project and the EK Project on which I worked have um, they both involved big databases of decorated metalwork. Um, this is purely due to the huge impracticalities of generating databases with the same geographical reach materials. With um, you'd end up with millions of objects, and I suspect that the analyses you might um, generate from a database like that may not be particularly meaningful. Similarly, studies of particular object types um, over wide geographical areas um, are a traditional mode of archaeological study. Um, they make, you know, they make nice sized PhDs, for example, and they mean that we don't often get to compare different kinds of objects against each other. So, with things in mind, um, my book tests an approach that looks at a broad and varied assemblage of different objects, but from a very small ge geographical area. It asks, what did Patton do of all objects from across that material assemblage? And by doing this, it aims to contribute to the reintegration of Celtic art objects with the rest of the archaeological record um, and to the redressing of the balance between art and craft. So the small geographical area in question is East Yorkshire in northeastern England. This region, uh, this region, region was chosen for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons um, 
was its substantial Middle Iron Age tradition of inhumation burials. So I'm sure lots of you will be familiar with these kind of burials. Um, they are generally um, found within large cemeteries in square ditched barrows. And you can see on the right of the screen there um, a really nice example of what these look like from above on the front of one, one of Ian Stead's books. Um, and within, within these cemeteries, there are um, some unusual types of burial as well, um, such as chariot burials, like the Wetwang village example, which you can see on the left of the screen. This burial tradition has seen lots of study in the past. It's really well documented. And crucially, the inhumation burials have yielded a large assemblage of varied plain and patterned objects. Um, you can read in detail about the burial rites in Mel Giles' book on um, Iron Age East Yorkshire, which I highly recommend. So this unusual archaeological record provided me with an opportunity to look at different kinds of plain and patterned objects in association with one another. And I also aim to compare these objects from burials with objects from settlement sites um, and from the single hoard um, that I included from the region as well. As well as contextualising funerary assemblages within the broader archaeological record, I also aim to provide um, temporal context to the objects um, from the primarily Middle Iron Age burial rites by setting myself a broad timescale encompassing the Middle uh, and Late Iron Ages, so that I was looking at 400 BC to 100 AD. So to carry out my, my research, um, I compiled a, a data set um, where I recorded um, full assemblages um, of finds from a sample of 30 sites, including um, cemeteries, settlements, um, a couple of mixed use sites and a hoard as well. Um, and I also included um, PAS data from the region. So all in all, this, this added up to you about 4,800 objects. Um, and I think that was probably the right number of objects for a three year PhD project. Um, although if I was able to do the project again, um, I think sort of knowing how your database is likely to look, um, it's much easier to, to include a, a bigger sample. So, you know, it would have been great to, to make that even larger. But, um, but this was the sample that I used um, for my study. So um, some of the basic tasks I needed to do were um, to place all my objects within one of two periods. So period one um, basically encompasses the Middle Iron Age and period two the Late Iron Age. Um, all objects were then categorised as plain, patterned, iron or unknown. Um, it was important to separate out iron here because, um, because of the corrosion um, of the vast majority of iron objects from Iron Age contexts. Um, all traces of um, decoration on these objects uh, will have been erased by the time that we get to look at them. So it's not, um, it wouldn't have been fair to, to try and categorise them as plain or pattern. Um, and all non-PAS objects were designated as coming from either, non, uh, either funerary or non-funerary contexts. And of course, this is a massive simplification of different kinds of archaeological contexts. But um, it, it kind of, it served a purpose for this particular analysis. So during the project, um, I was inspired by Cyril Fox's book on Celtic art, um, Pattern and Purpose. Um, and I borrowed the word pattern from Fox to refer to the particular kinds of decoration I wanted to study and quantify. Decoration is quite a broad word that can refer to lots of different things. Um, argu arguably, the idea of something being decorated or decorative is actually somewhat culturally um, or even personally specific in itself. Fox uh, doesn't define pattern in his work, but I think he broadly equates it with the word motif. And um, I'm, I'm using it in a similar way to talk about arrangements of motifs and marks on the surfaces of objects. Um, a problem with this comes when we want to distinguish between pattern and form, uh, which of course can be decorative in itself. 
categorizing objects as plain or patterned is actually a bit trickier than it sounds because all the decoration um, in the data set is to an extent three dimensional. It's all um, incised or impressed or molded, um, etc. So uh, the ostentatious lips on lips to turrets or rain rings like this one from Kirkburn, um, shown on the screen, um, are often categorised as decoration. Maybe we can see them as kind of an ultra 3D form of pattern. The same applies to the parallel winged turret at the top of the page there. Ultimately, I was really inclusive of pattern. All the objects on this page are categorised as patterned, including the 3D mouldings on the turrets and the simple border lines on the toggle and the finger ring. I found that a useful test was to ask whether, for example, a turret would still function as a turret without its lips or wings. Um, and I think in some senses it arguably would. So um, I'm going to show some graphs now um, just to give you a taster of what the analysis of the data set showed. Um, don't worry, there are only a couple of graphs. I'm not going to bore you with all of the graphs from the book. That would be very cool. Um, so here's an overview of all the non-ceramic objects from the data set. Um, now, I'm saying non-ceramic because um, due to the very large number of ceramic shards in the data set, there were over, over 3,000 out of a, a data set of 4,800. Um, Due to that very large number, I had to analyse those separately um, because they they skewed um, they skewed the data so much and made the the non ceramic results look very insignificant. So here's a review of the non ceramic objects, um, showing the broad types of contexts in which plain and patterned objects were found. The frequencies of objects from different contexts change over time. Um, demonstrating the dominance of the funerary record in the Middle Iron Age of the re region and the big increase in the uh, deposition practices resulting in PAS fines in the Late Iron Age, something we, we see across Britain and beyond. With this change, we also see a change in where pattern objects are being deposited. Um, so in the earlier period, um, mostly in, in graves, um, and then in the later period, you can see that Proportionally, they move um, to PAS fines um, and non-funeral contexts. This is partly, of course, due to my sample of sites um, and the, the specific biases associated with PAS fines. Um, but I think also due to genuinely changing practices in the Iron Age. I, also, um, I was also able to look at pattern in a bit more detail by splitting it down into different styles. Now, um, as you can imagine, this was quite a problematic time, um, not least because some objects contain uh, sort of multiple styles um, all, um, you know, all gathered together. But it did allow for a broad analysis and you can see the style categories that I used here. Um, and it, it just allowed me to look at um, which styles tended to appear in which materials and on which kind of objects. Um, now, like, like any research project, um, this, this project included its fair share of failures. Um, and I've decided to, to share this failure with you, and I have put it in the book as well. Um, because I think um, it's important to share our failures, um, partly because um, they affect what we do next and they inform us um, in, our, in our work. But also just, I think, acknowledging the fact that things don't always work out perfectly is probably quite a healthy thing. So in this case, I tried to uh, I, I tried to look at individual object types um, and look at where those um, had been deposited. Um, this didn't work because the categories were too small and too numerous. And they also didn't take into account the assemblages that some of these finds would have functioned as parts of of um, composite objects. So on the graph, I've put some red arrows on there pointing to chariot fittings on this graph. And of course, it's likely that these chariot fittings will have um, functioned not on their own, but as part um, of chariots. So this became a bit problematic. And I decided to um, look at this a bit differently. 
So I, I called on Fox once again um, and I adopted his idea of purpose. Um, Fox kind of gives a grouping of different kinds of purposes in his work and I, I kind of adapted this um, to fit into my assemblage. Um, so by doing this, I, I grouped objects into broad purpose categories, um, which you can see in the graphs here. And I was able to analyse those broad categories against um, pattern and style and context. Um, and you can see here, this is looking at um, the, the deposition of different purpose categories in different contexts. In summary, the analysis of the data set allowed me to say that certain patterns were deployed in certain contexts. Um, and I use an expanded definition of context here. I mean not only archaeological contexts, but also contexts of use and contexts on certain types of objects and materials. In other words, I found that there were relationships between pattern, purpose and archaeological context. I'm just going to pause here because uh, I need to apologise. I don't know if you guys can hear this, but my neighbour who lives in the next door flat has just put on some really loud music. So I hope you're not hearing it. Um, but if you are, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, so as, as Fox um, so rightly wrote about Celtic art, decorated iron objects were not just made to be looked at, they are useful objects. Fox didn't see their decoration as having a function in the way that other, their other attributes did. But I think we can reframe this and say that pattern was part of what made these objects useful and functional. Having established that different kinds of pattern were useful in different spheres of activity, I then wanted to look at how the relationship between pattern and purpose developed over time and the ways that patterned objects related to each other. So I decided to take um, a sample of objects from the data set and look at use wear, uh, damage, repair and modification to get an idea of how they've been used um, and whether the ways they were used changed over time or whether their destinies were kind of fixed by the patterns they bore. I selected a series of different group sets from the data set. Um, this is a term that I've, I've borrowed from Duncan Garrow and Chris Gosden who in turn have borrowed it from modern cycling, where it refers to the set formed by um, the, the brakes, the chain, the derailers, etc., of a bike. So Garen, uh, Garen and Gosden use it to refer to a set of chariot fittings, like this one that I've shown here on the slide. But I've actually broadened its use a bit to refer to other composite objects, um, namely sword scabbards and other, asso other assemblages of objects or fittings. Um, that are defined by their spatial proximity to each other. This is the type of investigation that might lend itself to a study of object biographies. And I did initially think of some of the objects in biographical terms, but I realized that group sets, the group sets I was examining um, just didn't fit within these biographical frameworks. Their components had sometimes come from varied origins and had varied histories um, and there was often a major tension between the whole and its parts. Whilst object biographies have undoubtedly been very, very useful to archaeologists, the concept is seeing increasing criticism um, arising from post-humanist archaeologies. And my personal view is that we should apply tools like object biographies on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think this case was one where imposing um, human-like sort of life structures onto these complex composite objects perhaps just didn't work and would have diminished the objects I was looking at. So in the book, I've taken an assemblage based approach to my composite objects um, and my group sets, looking at the relationships between components uh, without imposing a prescriptive framework. So um, I don't have time to go into too much detail about the findings from this part of the study, but I can condense them into a few main points. Firstly, um, the objects uh, that I examined generally had been um, pretty well used. Use wear was re readily visible at a macroscopic level um, and, and damage to some objects had also occurred. So this, um, this just reinforces what, what I said a few minutes ago. Um, decorated Iron Age objects were made to be used and they were useful objects. 
Secondly, um, when objects broke, they were repaired, um, thereby extending their usefulness um, for longer. Um, they were also sometimes modified in more deliberate ways, and in several cases, they were um, made from mixtures of old and new components. Although repairs and modifications were carried out by people with metalworking skill and tools, um, I suggest that these were different individuals to those who did the initial making and assembly of some of these objects. And I will return to that idea in a few minutes um, towards the end of the talk. Uh, lots of the repairs are completely unhidden. Um, they're very, very visible. And this might be um, accidental or due to the level of metalworking skill used to execute them. But I've suggested that um, there might have been more to it. Um, I've used the fact that decorative repairs exist in Iron Age East Yorkshire and further afield across Britain to suggest that perhaps repairs were left or made deliberately visible, adding value to already valued objects much like the Japanese repair tradition of Kintsugi. And I've, I've written a paper recently about, um, about uh, the idea of Iron Age Kintsugi. So if anyone would like that paper, let me know later on and I can send it to you. So in, in the repair tradition of, of Kintsugi, cherished ceramics when broken are repaired using lacquer mixed with powdered gold, creating um, a really striking visual effect and um, adding value to, um, to these ceramics through a specifically Japanese philosophy um, called wabi-sabi, which sees aging and imperfection as positive attributes. So quite a contrast um, to, what, um, to what we might imagine um, would bring value to objects. I think it's fair to say that in, in modern Western society, um, valuable attributes might be seen as things like pristineness and newness but this just shows that um, this is not a universal thing. Furthermore, um, pattern was sometimes used to juxtapose contrasting components against each other. The best example of this is the Grimthorpe shield, um, an assemblage of shield fittings that may or may not have been fixed together onto an organic backing, as you can see in, in the top right there. Through examining the shield, I found that the fittings had been collected together from at least two different shields and that their differing decorative patterns um, create a sense of contrast, emphasising those varied origins. And I perhaps observed a similar phenomenon in this assemblage of decorated bone and antler objects, um, where these decorated ob objects with differing degrees of wear were brought together um, and deposited within a pit. So to summarise, I've suggested that um, pattern may have had a role um, in the development of, um, of objects and also of assemblages um, that had patterns of age, um, modification, repair and use. Um, and I've suggested that pattern um, was used to emphasise these patterns of age. It's possible that um, objects like these had mnemonic purposes. Um, the Kirkburn sword that's shown here, um, this is a famously old object from Iron Age East Yorkshire. It was it was old when it was deposited, and it's been said by um, by quite a few archaeologists. Um, it's been suggested that this might have had um, mnemonic purposes, perhaps in oral histories. Um, and I th I, I'm currently working on a new project um, where I'm trying to look into a bit more detail at how that might have worked. Um, but I think I suggest in this book that um, this can be applied to lots of the objects that I looked at. It's also possible that um, these objects uh, accrued their value by looking old and that rather than having um, a deeper meaning, they were more like antiques objects that are valuable because they are old or because they look old. So I, I want to just circle back quickly to make some final points about the processes of creating pattern objects before I finish the talk. Um, the decision to decorate has been discussed by, by Jodie Joy as being of importance in the production of decorated Iron Age objects, um, something that may have dictated the life courses of objects. 
The analysis of the data set allowed me to examine this process in East Yorkshire. The production of an object arguably starts with um, the selection and procurement of raw materials, either following or ahead of the design process. My analysis showed that um, in my sample of objects, the materials that objects were made from played a part in dictating whether and how they were patterned. Certain patterns were found on objects of certain materials. Um, this was a big advantage of the holistic approach I took. It's, it's allowed for the confirmation that whilst archaeologists are rightly wary of projecting modern material categories onto prehistoric assemblages, the trends in this data set um, did tend to reflect to some extent the material categories that, that are commonly used by archaeologists today. I've suggested that the decision to make certain objects from certain materials was influenced both by the properties and affordances of materials and the intended functions of objects. These, these things need to align for an object to work. The materials chosen to make the objects in the data set reflect on many levels the purposes of the objects. For example, iron is a good material with which to make a sword blade or a spearhead, and clay is a good material from which to form a container. Considerations such as these were then also tempered with decisions relating to the visual and culturally contingent properties of materials. These properties combined with the availability of certain materials perhaps dictate specific choices of materials where functional objects could have been made from a range of different materials. These decisions also relate to pattern itself and the reasons why, um, why for example, Laten pattern was um, found almost exclusively on bronze objects in the data set, even though, as we know, it's possible to produce it in a whole range of other media. It's been argued that this series of choices might be seen as a craft person functioning within the bounds of, of what Andrew Fitzpatrick has termed um, as appropriate materials for certain objects and appropriate decoration for certain materials. Considering the relationship between instance and style of pattern and the purposes of objects, um, I think we can augment this to see um, to also see the process as the harnessing of useful characteristics which were intended to aid the functioning of an object. The analysis I pursued suggested that the initial decision to decorate was, was influenced by a balance of different factors. And these include um, um, as Fit, Fitzpatrick argues, the appropriateness and usefulness of certain materials for making certain objects, the availability of particular materials, the uses, usefulness of pattern in certain intended purposes, the appropriateness or usefulness of certain patterns on certain materials, and the personal aims and creativity of individual craft people as well. This complex picture shows that pattern could be seen as a way of fulfilling expectations of what certain objects should be like in Iron Age East Yorkshire, of adhering to existing ideas and traditions regarding which objects and materials should be patterned and which um, patterns were useful for different purposes, as well as harnessing the effects of particular combinations of material and decoration. And the change of, of decorative practices over time that I, I touched on earlier shows the gradual shift of these traditions. My investigations have allowed me to examine um, processes of design as well. It's been possible to see um, similar processes of adherence to broad traditions and sets of motifs whilst creating objects and designs that are unique. Um, these three swords have been referred to as cousins by Mel Giles. Um, they are in some ways a family of objects with similar designs, possibly made by the same maker um, and all deposited in graves. But when viewed close up, the uniqueness of their designs becomes obvious. And it's also clear that the ways they were used um, were not the same. Similarly, the designs of some terrets within the region have a distinctive and strongly local character. Um, their designs could be seen to reiterate each other and reinforce and reference each other. But they also have some distinctive differences when examined in detail again. I've discussed the possibility that Iron Age uh, design skill sets existed. This is particularly visible with Laten design because it uses a distinctive uh, lexicon of motifs arranged in unique ways, as seen um, 
as seen in Cyril Fox's grammar of Celtic ornament here. This is um, the grammar of ornament is something also produced by Jakob Saar. Um, there are some masterfully patterned objects in the data set, but there are also examples of less skillfully executed decoration. In the cases of sword scabbards, this appears as wobbly borders, possibly added to two examples. You can see an example here um, on the left hand side and a repair panel on the Kirkburn sword, which is decorated with um, un quite, I'd say unconfidently executed lines forming motifs that don't fit into the traditional lexicon, which is used um, on the main body of the scabbard front plate. We could see this possibly as representing the idea that designing and executing patterns were their own specialist skill sets and that we can see differing levels of these skills in different objects. I think this is maybe true of objects from other parts of Britain as well. Um, we are used to being shown the best of the bunch when it comes to decorated Iron Age metalwork, but there are plenty of objects out there with designs that were clearly um, meant to emulate these exemplary objects, um, but, but sometimes don't quite hit the mark. This brings up loads of questions about metalworking in Iron Age Britain, which there is not time to discuss here. I think that's a whole other talk. But these questions concern things like where, in real life terms, would a lexicon of Latin motifs have existed? And what were the relationships between metal workers and the rest of society? Um, Wedley, uh, Webley, Adam and Brooke have recently published um, a book on the social context of technology where they make some, some new suggestions about the structuring of non-ferrous metalworking in Iron Age Britain and Ireland. And I, I really recommend reading that. I won't, I won't go into any more detail now because I'm running out of time. Traditional ideas about the effects and deployment of Iron Age pattern relate to display and the expression of identity or status. The high frequency of patterned um, personal objects in the data set might be seen to support this idea that pattern has a role in sort of um, personal expression and it could relate to the projection of many different facets of identity, gender, community affiliations, age, or perhaps um, the expression of individuality rather than belonging, considering the emphasis sometimes placed on um, the individual in Iron Age East Yorkshire in Mel Giles's work. Recent work on the effects and deployment of Iron Age pattern, um, particularly by Mel Giles, Duncan Garrow and Chris Gosden, for example, um, has focused on its jellion qualities, its potential to enchant, confuse, and in a martial context, um, intimidate as well. Alfred Gell himself describes the use of patterns in psychological warfare and that idea has, has been applied to um, Iron Age weapons and shields. My examination of objects during this research also identified lots of very very fine decorative details that are only visible when you are very very close up to the object as you can see on the slide here. Um, if these designs are meant to be seen I think we can also suggest that some patterns had multiple functions depending on how they're viewed. For example, these chariot fittings um, may well have been designed to be seen close up in more personal, contemplative situations, as well as as part of a fast moving chariot. Perhaps the desired effects here were not fear, but other emotions or states of mind. And the same might be true of any of the objects discussed in this book, whether or not they're martial objects. As, as may have been expected, the answer to the research question um, that I posed earlier is not singular or clear cut. Um, but I think that what Patton did in Iron Age East Yorkshire can be distilled into three key effects. Um, firstly, Patton allowed craftspeople to play with form and materials and tools in experimental ways, whilst simultaneously reiterating traditional expectations um, and working within um, sets of design traditions. Um, in some cases, this process um, perhaps also involved practicing within somewhat esoteric design rules, providing um, a, a different sort of form um, of exercising your skill and knowledge. Secondly, pattern was made for a range of intended purposes, which contributed to the functioning of objects in different spheres um, of activity. These purposes, um, as I've discussed, included um, 
perhaps um, display expression, um, the projection of certain identities, um, psychological warfare, contemplation, and of course, um, the key thing that I haven't talked about much, deposition, um, an important function of decorated objects. And thirdly, pattern contributed to the visible accumulation of, of patterns of age and use on some objects. Um, and I've argued this added value to these objects, um, possibly as heirlooms, mnemonics, antiques, um, and perhaps providing a stimulus for oral histories. Of course, um, as with all research, there is the tantalising question of what lies just outside the sample that I've discussed today. Although um, East Yorkshire is undoubtedly the centre of uh, some distinctive Iron Age traditions, its objects are also part, uh, parts of much broader supra-regional traditions, which I've been able to touch on in the book, and which I hope demonstrate the merit of a, a holistic approach um, to this material assemblage. Thank you very much for listening, um, and please feel free to email me if you want to. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Jen. <laughs> I'll just I was just reading what you were um, the, the those you were thinking. <laughs> um, all right, so let's start off with some questions. If anybody has them, otherwise I will throw in a couple. <laughs> Oh, we have David here saying thank you. Well, thank you for listening. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, who is that? Uh, yeah, Dave, you can you can um, just ask your question. Oh, hi. Um, thanks very much. Okay. Um, that's really interesting. So 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 rich. Um, I must say, I really like the kintsugi stuff. I'll be very interested to hear more thank of that because that I'm whole. Glad you like that. A much wider question about uh, aging and wear and whether this is a positive thing or a negative thing and it's so culturally specific and actually so interesting when you suddenly realize how different these can be and um but um more of a throwaway thing partly what you're not i mean yeah slightly out of the view i was just thinking i mean something that's always intrigued me was that with this wonderful wealth of decoration that ceramics has not been part of this apart from glastonbury ware I mean, here in Leicestershire, we have this in Northamptonshire. There's this is sort of late that late Iron Age. There's some sort of decorated squirrely stuff, yes. but actually, it's not it's not that common, and it's always puzzled me when it seems to be sort of crying out, <laughs> crying out to be so much of this stuff would look so brilliant on pot. I just wonder if you had any thoughts about why. I mean, I can see that sort of appropriate materials, obviously, and also, but and we're also stuck with that thing that. We don't have much wood, but occasionally on wood we see they're doing this of wood. Maybe lots of wood was decorated. But I was just wondering if you hadn't had any thoughts about this at all or not. I mean, you maybe Absolutely. know, I don't know, I have no idea. But uh... No, definitely. I mean, um, you mentioned wood just there, and um, I didn't mention it in the talk, of course, but um, yeah, the wooden artefacts that we, we do know of um, from Iron Age Britain are quite often really nicely decorated. I, I showed the, the Blacklock Bowl which has got some really um, unique Iron Age decoration that doesn't resemble anything else that I've seen in Britain. Um, and of course, the amazing shield um, excavated by, I, it was you last, wasn't it? I think you excavated yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Um, again, with really um, decoration that isn't something that we've seen before. So like you say, there's a whole wealth of, of um, organic artifacts out there that we just don't have anymore. And that I'm sure would have displayed a whole range of kinds of decoration. Um, with pots, um, I mean, it, I guess pottery decoration in the Iron Age is such a regional um, phenomenon. And in Iron Age East Yorkshire, um, there's a kind of overall idea that it's very plain. And while that's true of um, pottery from funerary contexts, there's actually a lot more decoration outside of funerary contexts from settlement contexts, which 
is quite interesting in itself because it, it's sort of I've written about before the, the contrast between plane and pattern in graves where you have um, you know richly decorated objects paired with a, a plain ceramic jar and I think there's something important there about the contrast that that creates. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, yes, yes. Thank, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, I must say the pottery, yeah, because that pottery thing, it just brings to mind, yeah, because actually in a lot of African ceramics, so I, know, I mean, the, it's interesting there that there are some, it can be incredibly elaborated, but also there are other occasions when, in certainly for certain sorts of ritual vessels, they are always actually very plain for really important things. They're not elaborated and they're very plain. They look immensely dull to sort of archaeologists. And, uh, oh, that's, that's so interesting. I have come across that. It's in West Africa, that's one thing that has been noted. And they will, it's very old fashioned, traditional, plain, undecorated stuff. That's the stuff you use for rituals. Oh, you don't cool. use fancy stuff, which is kind of an interesting. Um, is, an there, interesting. is there a reason for that that's, that's kind of documented at all? Do we, do we know why? <sighs> Some explanations have been that this is the sort of the most traditional um, and so even if there's more and people are saying well yes oh yes all this decorated stuff is newfangled but it's not yes but you actually got to use the really old-fashioned stuff for, and it may be it's sometimes framed in those terms um, but it's, yeah, it's I, complex but... became often counterintuitive sometimes because also you know in other areas you know some places people have really elaborated pottery for all their sort of um, more ritual uses, but uh, anyway. mm. yeah, no, I, th I think there's something there about um, about adhering to long-standing traditions. Certainly in East Yorkshire, with the use of, of plain vessels in graves, um, that's something that I've looked into before um, because these are the vessels that are very, um, you know, they're a traditional form in the region. Um, and yeah, I think there's there's something there. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Helen? Go ahead, Julia. Thanks, Julia. Oh, hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> you all right? Uh, nice to see you. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, I hope you're doing well. That was a really lovely paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. That's all right. It's a pleasure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wondered several of the objects where you showed um, things that have been kind of repaired and these kind of sets that obviously have these um, kind of more complex histories of things being like, you know, um, taken apart and brought back together, and it's being introduced, um, are from graves. And I wondered if you um, are more of those things from from graves, like things that have a, a bigger kind of story to them. And if so, do you think that's just because of the difference in the kind of material that that we find, effectively a kind of taxonomic thing, um, or do you think that's something specific about the objects that are being sort of buried with people? So with those objects, um, from from the sample that I looked at, um, in the Middle Iron Age those objects um, with the sort of complex um, configurations that have, have been sort of, you know, bits have been recycled and added on and then repaired and all of that do tend to be from graves. And actually in the, the later part of the period I looked at, um, those objects were found in uh, the South Cave hoard. So I, I think that shows a quite interesting shift um, in focus from um, from burials to other forms of deposition, which um, you could see in, in the graphs I showed, um, it really shows up in the PAS data massively, but I think that's another way that it shows up. Um, so I, I mean, I think it's, it's really tempting to equate um, the sort of trajectories of objects and the trajectories of the people they're buried with but um, I'm, I'm nervous of doing that sometimes because they don't always match up. As you know, like the Kirkburn sword, for example, is a very old sword buried with quite a young man, um, suggesting that it's maybe it, it belonged to this person, but it also had another life before he was probably born. Um, so, yeah, there's 
there's something special about those objects um, and they've certainly been deposited in ways that are really specific um, and in occasions that um, will have been sort of momentous in a way. Um, yeah, does that answer you? Yeah, no, that's lovely. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was precious. <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question? If any, if anyone else has got them, but they don't want to ask them now, you're all very welcome to email me with any queries. Yeah, actually, I think Simon said that he emailed you some things. So, oh, ooh, thank you, Simon. You have something to look forward to. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah, my email address is just my full name, Helen Chittick, at gmail.com. So it's a very easy one. Um, and if anyone needs it, um, Jen will be able to give it to you as well. Yes. Um, I did want to ask a question if if no one else was going to ask it. It might be something that you go into more detail in your book and maybe I just need to read that. But um, I have a question um, about combs and decoration and the utilitarian and social dimensions of them as tools. Now, you've You've read uh, Tina Tui's work, right? Yes. <laughs> well, I was actually just, I was flipping through this book while you were discussing some of the things about antler combs. And one of the things that really hadn't occurred to me until I looked at this was how symmetrical the patterns are for combs and not, you know, as sinuous or asymmetrical as some of the other types of um, patterns. Um, and I guess my question is, have you looked, or are there any studies, have you looked at um, the differences psychologically between cultures that tend towards structured patterns and those that tend towards asymmetrical patterns? That's a really interesting question. Um, so, I that is not something I've considered. But um, I think it's an interesting one because in so in the Iron Age decoration that I'm describing, um, asymmetry is quite a key um, quite a key characteristic of British um, Latin art um, found on metalwork. So on lots of the the metal objects that I would have been showing. Um, you find deliberate asymmetry. Sometimes it's even it even seems like it's designed to trick your brain a bit because it's nearly symmetrical, but then there's a little bit that's not, um, and it kind of gives you that moment of confusion. And I think that's quite deliberate. Um, like you say, decoration on combs, um, for example, is often a lot more symmetrical. Um, and I think within what I've been arguing for, this just shows and kind of reinforces the idea that different patterns were made for different purposes. So, um, and, it, and that's the reason why these patterns were found on, on in different object types. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, the reason why I asked this question is because it's an interesting social dimension. Um, I know that there are people out there who have suggested, and I. I know there's a PhD student who is looking into the pattern on weaving combs. <laughs> Listen to me say weaving combs. And um, the reflection in the abstract of um, patterning that you might see on textiles. Now, with textiles, if you if you look at like knitting scripts for um, Fair Isle, it's all done with these little squared boxes, even though the, the stitches themselves for knitting make heart shapes mm -hmm. and for weaving, you can actually get some more asymmetry depending on how you have your loom set up and whether you're doing tapestry weaves or tabby. These all kind of factor into how the textile looks 
And I find that like a really interesting way of structuring the mind and being reflected in the way that people may have chosen to decorate certain types of objects. I'm still never convinced about the weaving attribute, even though with my analysis, there may be some combs that probably were for weaving. Um, other combs, according to you, swear that I've done, seems to be inconsistent with that function. And so, I mean, this is a developing thought and I, I doubt I'll have space to put it in the thesis, but I was just thinking about how um, undecorated combs might actually be foregrounded by this discussion of plainness versus decorated. Um, and, me, you know, maybe tomorrow I'll spend some time looking at this, but if there are different purposes, then the functionality of the stylistic attributes might be social signaling that's really obvious. So, you know, undecorated combs might be undecorated for purposes that are otherwise being obscured by this weaving moniker that gets applied to them pretty much automatically. So that yeah. would be an interesting dimension to consider. I think you're right. I mean, my my personal thoughts about long handle combs are that they're very much multi-purpose objects um and like like you say each comb um not all combs were used for exactly the same purpose um and i i did some work on use wear on combs a long time ago and and um and i, I came to the conclusion that some of them might have been used in kind of multiple different ways um as well so I, I think from what you're saying, yeah, it could be really interesting to have a look at um, how the patterns on combs relate to the use wear on the teeth to see if you've got a division of, of different kinds of functions there that's reflected in the decoration. I think that would be really interesting. I mean, I, I am sort of limited because there are um, combs that uh, I wasn't able to access and I was only looking at Danebury and my the total subset of combs that I could actually look at was I think 23, 23 combs. So it's not a really big number. Um, I make an argument that it needs to be uh, expanded to really understand more about the, the utilitarian purpose. Um, but as I mentioned in my later prehistoric finds group paper on deposition, you know, these are important elements to consider about like the the union or the, the overlap from the utilitarian perspective and the um, non, I guess to say non-utilitarian perspective is more inclusive than to say just social. But, um, you know, th there could be other operators that um, have have uh, been manifested on these objects. It's just we've not been reading them in the way that, you know, someone who was living in the Iron Age and exposed to all this stuff would have easily been able to understand. So it's been a fascinating process, like just hearing about your ideas over the last, I don't know, several years about pattern um, and it, it, it's getting closer and closer and closer to like this utilitarian aspect, which is, I feel part and parcel. Like, I've always felt like you can't really understand um, like this, the social function if you don't also understand the utilitarian function. And the utilitarian function is kind of pointless without really understanding the, the social context that all fits in. So hopefully we'll, we'll um, I'll be able to read your book. <laughs> the time where's the time um to uh, to see what you actually say but i think this is a really exciting direction thanks very much jen does anyone else have questions or follow-up comments on anything okay well um i'll i'll if you want to just pop your email into the chat real quick um, oh, I'll, I'll just close things out so that it doesn't get on too late. Uh, and again, on behalf of the Wednesday seminar team, I would like to thank you for joining us and hope that everyone else enjoyed this discussion in the same way that I did.
Um, and the recording will go live on Blackboard as soon as possible, um, sooner than the one from last week, because I have to do some video editing. This one will be very short and sweet. So, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks very much for inviting thanks me, Jen. And, and thanks to everyone for attending as well. Um, I'm really grateful. Um, and I'm, I'm just, just popping my email in the chat box in case anyone has any further questions.